That was very nice. I'm actually traveling in some of your futures because I'm drinking the August tea of the month, which I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's quite wonderful. So uh, for those of you who haven't been following each week, if you are looking to for some guidance in your tea practice to deepen it or begin it, <coughs> we have an online tea course coming up in July. I've been putting a lot of work, filling notebooks, um, getting ready. It's going to be very exciting. It's going to be an intro to Cha Dao. Uh, there's going to be a lot in it for new students and for old students, for everybody. And we've never done an online course, so if this one goes well, we'll, we'll do some more. Maybe uh, later in the year, who knows. So uh, you should go sign up. The link is, will be posted below. It's, it's tehotcourses.com. And uh, you'll have access to the course for a month. So you don't have to. We'll be doing a uh, two-hour session every day. Plus, I'll give some voluntary homework. So you could turn it into a whole week of tea extravaganza if you like. Or you can not do the homework. And you can also just watch the video slowly over the course of the month. And there'll be lots of supplementary materials as well. Some articles and things from the magazine. And places for you to look and other videos that will help collaborate to make it... Uh, a very fruitful course. So we've been each week going over a Zen slogan. I think it's a great format for these live broadcasts. We set up these live broadcasts. We were doing them monthly before um, the pandemic, and then we started doing them weekly. Um, and the format has kind of been oh, like a question and answer. But that can be potentially misleading because... I don't think the value really of a Zen teacher is to provide answers. I think actually it's the opposite. It's my job to provide questions. And so if you just take what I say as an answer, it's not really of much use. Because that's just a, adds to a collection, a library of philosophical concepts that you carry around. The idea is to explore, to wonder, to question, to think, to then apply and hopefully change the way you live and awaken. So awakening is the goal, not a collection of ideas or um, answers, but the process of questioning which can result in awakening. So that's why I like these slogans because they're, they're pithy and deep and I can comment on them a little bit, but the commentary isn't meant to be the answer. It's meant to be an avenue of exploration, a road that you could take, um, but you're also free to go off the path and think about these things in, in any way you like. I hope that's clear. That's the, certainly my intention and my orientation towards teachings given and received. So today's slogan, I thought we would come down to something a little bit uh, lighter and simpler. But in Zen, as in life, actually the simpler the, it is, often the deeper it is. More powerful, in part because it's simple. Um, and this slogan actually comes from Thich Nhat Hanh, who you know, we can send prayers to. He's had a stroke and... I, I heard it, that he was only able to speak three words and they were uh, breathe, happy, practice. Which, uh, you know, a life of, that's a life of practice and we could all hope that our three, only three words in such a situation would be thus. But the slogan from him is, you smile and the world changes. You smile and the world changes. It's a really good one. Uh, and it, it, it is so simple and yet absolutely profound 
absolutely so so powerful on the one hand it's talking about connection it's talking about the interbeing of all things and how all things are connected to each other nothing exists independently so in order for there to be a buddha there has to be a sun there has to be plants there has to be air there has to be water there has to be and so on 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 so all things are connected and one of the roots of our human suffering is separateness our sense of separation which isn't a real separation in real scientific truth you are a part of all things you're made up of stardust and sun and water and wind and minerals etc but there's a sense of separation and that sense of separation if it was real it would be much more difficult to bridge but it's not so we can break through it and we do all the time so that sense of separation is a part of our uh, suffering it's a root of our suffering it's one of the main ingredients in our suffering and that's why one of the most basic needs of all human beings is love because love you could say bridges but that bridge isn't real the separation isn't real so what love really does is remind us of our connection to each other and to all things so love reminds us of connection and uh, it's why we we need it so much and the more separation there is uh, the more suffering there's a story I, I don't know how true it is but it's quite poignant about an anthropologist who went to study with the Hopi and the Hopi you know live in a semi-arid climate and so like a lot of uh, indigenous people in agrarian societies a lot of their spiritual and ritual life is devoted to making it rain and bringing in the rain and they sing a lot of songs and this anthropologist was recording songs that's what he's there to study and he was recording songs recording songs and so the story goes he said one day to the shaman uh, wow you know it's, it's so many of your songs have to do with water what do you think about that and the shaman said well people sing for what they yearn for they sing for what they need the most and what we need the most is water then the shaman poked him and said do you ever wonder why all your songs in your culture are about love so i think that's quite powerful so that's a whole half of this uh, you smile and the world changes is basically like there's another zen slogan right you drop a pebble in the water and the world changes this is like butterfly stuff the world is the is open there's a second half to this it's not separate really from that truth of connection but it but it's actually um, has its own light which is that sometimes we get really caught up in the ego especially gets really caught up in grand schemes grand changes big ideas big revolutionary changes in 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 global or even cosmic systems and we forget that the power in little things it's like one of my favorite movie scenes right when uh, in the in the hobbit and and Galadriel asks Gandalf why the Hobbit and he says that Saruman thinks that the world is changed through the deeds of great men but I think the darkness is held at bay by all the little smiles and hugs and good deeds of, of ordinary people so little things like a smile can have really powerful ripples actually and one of the reasons is back to the first thing that we talked about which is is that they arise naturally those small little things that we do like a smile a real smile i'm not talking about a fake smile an artificial smile that's created by the mind i'm talking about a smile that's made by the heart it doesn't there's it's involuntary it's an involuntary expression of the heart's opening right it's not an artificial like smile for the camera or you know kind of but but involuntary right and that's the key because when it's happening involuntarily 
that little thing. It's actually, it's coming out of the space of connection, the space where we're all connected, that namaste place where I, when I'm resting in mine and you're resting in yours, we're the one with our common humanity. And that little deed happening unconsciously then is a, is a expression, a transmission of that energy. And that can hit people and remind them of that to, to, to transcend their separation, even just for that moment. Right? We have within us the essence of that person is just like me. We have that essence inside of us and that smile can come out of that and then that person maybe goes to that place in themselves too. And uh, in this way, there's not any ego involved in it. There's not any machinations or deliberations involved in it. Like uh, Dogen, the founder of my lineage in Zen, Dogen, he said that real compassionate action is like fluffing your own pillow in night when, when you're asleep. This is powerful. Because at night you're sleeping and you reach up and like fluff your own pillow. There's no deliberation. There's no ego. There's no desire to be a good person. So you're not doing good to appear good. You're not doing good to participate in some grand scheme that you think is going to figure out the world and all of its problems or something. You're doing good without any do-gooder. You're doing a good deed and not getting caught in the, in the words of, like that's how Jesus would, uh, you know, it's paraphrasing more of the, the Christian mentality. You're, you're, you're doing it naturally. And you're doing it naturally because your arm is doing it for your body because they're one. They're not separate. Right? Just like that involuntary smile that comes from a heart opening is smiling from the place of connection beyond separation and it can lead, lead another to that because it's um, because it's it's smiling because of the sameness the oneness it's not smiling to appear as a smiler that's more the smile the smile for the camera but when the smile is involuntary because it's the it's an expression of an open heart then it's shining from beyond separation it's shining that truth and so it's it's doing compassion out of oneness right it's like if your right hand if your left hand is burning your right hand pulls it out your right hand doesn't sit and think hmm if I pull that out, I might get burned too. I'm not sure, right? Nor does it, th does it look and like, I hope lots of people are looking to see me do this so that they can see how good of a guy I am, right? It's not after reward. It's not contemplating consequences. It reaches out in because automatically because they are one. So out of oneness comes the perfect compassionate act. The involuntary smile is one um, emblem of that, which is used in this slogan, you smile and the world changes. So it's, a, it's about connection and interbeing and a lot of contemplations and thoughts about that. But it's also about uh, little things that really keep the darkness at bay and not forgetting them. Especially like now, there's a lot of big things going on. And it's okay to talk about the big things and get involved even. Right? But even within the big things, there's little things. Right? So even within the, you know, just to use the one, um, you know, poignant example is, you know, within the uh, protests in the 60s of the Vietnam War, we have this really special moment where the hippie puts the flower in the policeman's gun, right? And there's an, happened to be a photographer there and it becomes a symbol for, for peace. So you have little acts happening all over the world uh, all the time. And uh, we can forget about these as we face big uh, collective adversity, which we have faced through this pandemic. 
and it's brought out a lot of opportunities for transformation and change. But uh, it's important to remember that the real compassion is comes from is not trying to look cool or look good or be on on the right side or, or any of that image stuff. Real compassion comes out of oneness and it helps to heal that root of one, one of the roots of our suffering, which is that sense of separation from nature and from each other. So lots to contemplate for you to think about for the week as you drink tea. We have some questions now. We have an app, so you can put your questions on the app, then you don't even have to be here live. You could watch these broadcasts later and your question would still be answered. So if, if you're a Global Tea member, you can go in the app and leave questions. If you're not a Global Tea member, sign up for Global Tea. What are you doing? Okay, a uh, question from Joe. Um, he's asking, when drinking tea, how can one commune in conversation with her and connect to the nature and the cosmic energy without allowing the base of things like flavor and color impairing the connection to connect more with the cha chi and shan of nature? Mm, there's a long question. I don't even know how to paraphrase it. How can one connect to tea, I guess, as a spirit and to nature and to that like sense of interbeing that we were just talking about in the, uh, as we discussed the slogan? And then the second question, I guess, was how to not allow flavor and aroma to get in the way of that as you're trying to connect to the chi. Um, so those are two separate questions. The first question, you know, the path of tea is a path of listening. So uh, in Chinese we call gobu, is listening. Uh, gobu is the, you know, it's hard to translate, but essentially listening. Listening not just with the ears, but with the whole body. So receptivity is the answer. And that means you need to quiet your mind, uh, which is why, you know, the which is useful in so many areas of life, not just in communing with tea. It's essential for all spiritual practice. Um, and, you know, so there are three spiritual techniques you can use. You can choose any one you like. Um, they are all, all three really wonderful. You can choose any of the three that you like. All three lead to enlightenment, so it's really great. You can choose either meditation, meditation, or meditation. Uh, so meditation is the answer. Uh, to the second question, uh, the question itself is faulty. Because you're assuming that T's real communication happens through uh, chi or, or cosmic energy and not through flavor and aroma. But flavor and aroma are cosmic energy. And they are also communication. So that's a bit like me saying to Connor, like, I want you to n never talk to me again. We are only going to communicate through the cosmic rays that come through our eyes. And I'm not being facetious. I am very open-minded to the cosmic rays transmitting through the eyes. The shan, the spirit, does go through the eyes. Eyes are powerful. You can tell a lot about what, where someone is with the eyes. And eyes are a huge part of human communication as well. Uh, but, but so are words. And a lot comes through with words. Um, I think in Kung Fu tea, flavor and aroma can even get in the way of you experiencing some of the deeper levels of tea. And so sometimes in order to become more sensitive to those deeper levels, you have to uh, go, you know, kind of ignore them for a little bit. But then the idea is they come back. Just like you have to learn to quiet your mouth to meditate and try to quiet the dialogue in your mind um, so that you can get kind of beyond, beyond the thoughts. But the idea is not to be a zombie and just walk around all day. So the idea is that the, the, the words can, that we can maintain that state through the words, words or no words, right? So external quietude is useful for practice. But if your practice is dependent on external quietude, then you're only peaceful when you're in a quiet place. 
and that's not very useful. There's not many quiet places in the world today. You go to a mountain even, and a plane goes overhead or whatever. So you can use the external quietude to develop a foundation in your internal stillness so that you will be still whether there is external quietude or not. So you can maybe in Gongfu Ti intentionally like ignore the flavor and aroma a little bit to get at the more subtle aspects so that, but then those are, those will come back. Those are a huge part of tea's communication to us human beings. If tea didn't taste good and smell good, there wouldn't be a millennia old relationship with it. And there's an incredible power in that. If you just go question it and unpack it and think about the fact that nature, and according to some people, unconscious plants, were able to develop chemistry to so perfectly meet the senses of animals for their mutual benefit, like fruit, you know? That it's like you basically, if you want to anthropomorphize this, what I'm saying is like if the plants are unconscious, which some assume, I do not, but let's assume that just for playing devil's advocate, you know, how did they know that we would love mangoes so much? Right? And you can say like trial and error, trial and error, but there's, there's still just a, oh, okay, but, and I'm open to that, but that's, that's still a form of communication. That's a communication of like me and a Russian where there's a lot of trial and error because we don't speak each other's language. And then slowly as time goes on, we speak each other's language more until we're both fluent in each other's language. And uh, so the fact that nature could create things that align with my senses in bliss and what that bliss shows me is also quite amazing. So um, I would rethink that question, question that question, right? Someone on YouTube says, uh, I want to tell you that I've been reading Fallen Leaves and it has been a great read during my tea sessions. I also took some of the recommendations from when I asked about the other stuff and read uh, send fresh and send bones, and I'm about to start Old Path White Cloud. Mm. Yeah, Old Path White Cloud is really great. That's Thich Nhat Hanh as well. It's probably one of my favorite telling of the Buddha's life. It's very well written and very inspiring. And thank you for the compliment about Fallen Leaves. Um, I, I don't think I'm a great poet, but I do enjoy writing those poems, especially the cheeky, rascally kind of Zen, Zenish ones. Angelica is asking, how do you know when a teacher is your teacher? Can you please tell us the story of how you knew when you met yours? Uh, how do you know when a teacher is your teacher? Um, well, there's two levels. On the, one, on the one hand, like, all is my teacher. All that is not me is my master is, is, is another Zen slogan. Uh, that one comes from Zhao Zhou, who was actually a, a tea lover as well. As there's a lot of tea stories related to him, Joshua in Japanese. Um, all that is not me is my master. Is you know the the a, a sign of awakening is a return of the wonder that you lost as a childhood, that curiosity that connected you to all things that made you come up and be like, wow, wow, wow. That wonder returning is a is a sign of awakening. It's a symptom of it. And it comes through receptivity and beginner's mind. The I don't know mind facilitates wonder and awe. And that relationship to the world is powerful. And you have but to ask yourself, like, are you happier for the loss of that wonder? And if you have little children in your life, hang out with them for a little bit. And then see who's the happier one. Then we'll see who's the happier one, right? And that, you know, even taking that a step further, 
through, the, through that wonder comes that magic and the openness to a creative participation with the world as opposed to uh, I think I know it and therefore it's over there and I'm over here but some kind of creative participation that's not even it doesn't it have to be real it's because it's our creativity and we're participating in it and this is the magic of watching Harry Potter or reading Lord of the Rings one time I I had this friend, her, his daughter had wanted to make tea for me for a long time. And she's like, you know, three or four years old. And so I was in town, but I've been busy. Uh, she had had this, you know, the year before she had wanted it and there wasn't any time because there was a really busy schedule when I was in town. And then the, this time, I did have a day off and they were really like reluctant to try to like foist this on me. They were like, you know, we only have one day off. We want to really want to sit in our basement with a little plastic tea set and our little girl and drink tea. But it was important to the little girl. So I said, yeah. And I went there and she, you know, with all her heart, she was like just so invested in this. Like she'd obviously wanted it for a year. So it was like, it was really, she was super invested in it. And there I was patronizing her. And, and also in that twisted human way, trying to not patronize her, you know, like wanting to remember what it was like to be her, wanting to connect to her, but at the same time having another voice that's like, isn't this cute? There's not really water in that pot, right? And she's pretending and blah, blah, blah. So she hands me the tea and, it, you know, the tea and I take the cup of what is in reality air, right? And I'm holding it and I'm, you know, pretending to drink. And again, I, I'm battling inside. I'm trying to like to, to, to experience what she is. And at the same time, there's another voice in me that's just like, you know, like I can't really participate in this, you know, but I'd like to. And on the other hand, like, I remember, I literally remember what it felt like as a kid when you were playing a game and some adult came in the room and you had to, like, stop because adults were weird. They were, like, a little bit alien. They don't get it. Like, I remember that feeling of, like, they don't get it. And what don't they get? That You know, so I'm, I'm in this, like, conflict. I'm drinking the tea. She looks up to me with, you know, she's three, so the most adorable, huge little eyes and says to me, do you like the tea? And with all that conflict in me, I said, yes, I love it. And then she, she blew me away. She blew all the conflict away. Of course, not, it didn't last. It wasn't forever. I wasn't fully awakened by her. But for a moment, she blew all the conflict out of me. And there was just, you know, a, a pure moment, a, a Satori moment or something. Because she said, do you, do you like the tea? And I said, there I was, yes. I like it, all confused. And then she said, that's good, because it's made of rainbows. And uh, that just, you know, really blew me away, touched me. And so there's that openness and receptivity that is the path of tea of listening and learning and being in the I don't know mind. That is the way of Zen. And so all things are my teacher. And I can go to anyone to, um, to learn. Now, then there's a, another answer to the question, right? And so that, that, that learning is available everywhere in all things. All things that are not me are my master. Um, and then there's, you know, a more personal relationship with a teacher. Um, and that can be like so-called monogamous. You might have just one for your whole life. I've had three. I'm fortunate. I'm really blessed. Um, and for me, that... I don't, I don't have an answer for how you know other than like you just do. It's like the, um, it's like, it's like falling in love. It's like, it's just karmic. There's billions of people in the world. Why did you choose that one? You know? You can give me some superficial answer. He's handsome. He's uh, charming. 
we have a Torah lot to do. She's smart and pretty, yeah, but so are lots of women. It's a, you know, it's almost like when that's there, you can't get away from it even if you try. Even your mind is like, you know, because just like in romance, right? In the beginning, it's all pink cloud. You're just like, oh, so wonderful. What a wonderful, wonderful person. And then you get to know them and then you realize, no, they have all these character defects and flaws just like you. And now that's what, only then, only when you really know someone can real love begin. Because what you were loving before was your own projection or what that person was trying to present to you, what they wanted you to think about them, not who they really were or your own projections of who you thought they were. But now that you really know them and all their dirt, you can now to love through that. That's where real love becomes possible. So there's no perfect teacher. It's the same thing. You might have this idea like he's so wise, he's so peaceful. And then you get to know that person and they have dirt and they have, uh, you know, piccadillies and foibles and all kinds of bad habits and other things, but that's when real love becomes possible. And so just like in a romance, it's like at, when you get to that stage, when it's, when it's real, which, you know, I hope you've experienced, it's like a, it's like even when your mind tries to say, oh, he's sloppy and he does this and this and this and this and this, I can't stand it. You can't get away. You see what I mean? There's a, there's like a part of you, it, it, even when your mind's critical, there's a bond that, uh, that is there. And then you realize that that critical mind is just like really, um, such a obstacle. It's boorish and judgmental. And, uh, so I think the key also is to stop looking for somebody perfect you know if if the requirement for being a teacher was you had to be a fully enlightened buddha in the mountains who only spoke truth and there was a society of such people somewhere in the himalayas like you know i wouldn't be welcome there i'd ruin that place i would i would make that place you know they'd kick me out i couldn't learn there so like I, I'm broken and dented and I need, I'm, le I'm learning how to practice in a way that is, uh, you know, so to, 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 to see, live with a little bit more grace and connection to the light. And so a, a person who's traveled that path from broken to healed, maybe a little further than me, will have the wisdom and guidance that I need to travel that path. Um, so I... You know, I think in general, it's also useful when questions like this come up to, to just talk about, at least from my perspective, there are a lot of traditions and a lot of ways and a lot of different types of medicine. And just because a medicine is not for me doesn't mean it's not medicine. So just because that medicine doesn't heal me doesn't mean it won't heal somebody. Yeah. So for me, though, uh, I'm not defining authenticity in terms of the role of teacher as some kind of like holiness. I'm not a holy man. My teacher is not a holy man. I'm not trying to sit on a higher seat than anyone else. In Zen and T, we all sit on the floor. And there's not the, the question of who is superior and who is inferior is not even a useful question. It's so, it's a question that, like who's in charge, who's high, who's low, who ranks where, is a very Western mentality and it doesn't function in a Zen system or a T system. T is nature, so in nature that certainly hierarchy doesn't um, function because things literally physically, their bodies flow in and out of each other. This eats this, this eats this, this eats this, and some then big things eaten by a bunch of little things when it dies. Do you see? You might first look with your Western mind and see hierarchy. No, top of the food chain. But it doesn't really work that way. 
Because even the being at the top of the food chain, when they die, a bunch of little beings come and eat them up. Right? So the fallen leaf returns to the roots. The, the things are flowing. So there is no hierarchy. And so, you know, you want an example of that. Um, is if you look to martial arts, when martial arts went west, there was the invention of all these colored belts. White belt, yellow belt, yellow belt, blue, blue belt, red belt, blue, 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 and all these little like levels and tests. When actually, the, 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 in, in, in China there was no belts at all. In, in Japan there were belts. There was a white belt and a black belt. But where, the, where that demarcation came from actually was that all belts were white, but dudes that had practiced for like 25 years, by that time their white belt was dirty. So dirty, it was black. And that's where the idea of a black belt really ultimately came from, was just like an earned dirt <laughs> from the decades of practice. So this rank system, right, is a... Um, is an egoic game that we play with others, like, uh, you know, of, of, of who's higher, who's, who's lower. And so, um, if you're approaching, you, you know, that might work somewhere, but if you're approaching me anyway, as with some kind of teacher test, the answer is I fail. I fail miserably. Let's just get it over with. Give me the F and let me leave. Because, the problem with your test is, first of all, I don't know what you're testing me based on. I mean, is it, is it good looks? Then, of course, I fail. Is it what? What do you, you know, some kind of foo-foo spiritual power? I fail again. I'm just a dude. So, I don't know what you're testing. I don't, I, it's like I didn't, you're giving me a pop quiz, and I didn't have the material to study. The second problem is then you're going to grade it. So you're going to grade it however you like, no matter how I show up for it. And the third bigger problem is that you're just going to test me again in the future. You're looking to fail me. Humans like to put other humans on pedestals, and then they also like to knock them down. Both of those games are very uninteresting to me um, in terms of me doing that to another person or in having other people do that to me. And a very uninteresting game. Um, I'm, you know, the question, uh, so that kind of, if you're, if you're looking for credentials in terms of higher or lower, uh, you know, I, for me personally, I don't want to play that game. There are people that will if you need that medicine. Um, and that might, again, just because it's not medicine for me doesn't mean it's not medicine for somebody. Uh, but it's not for me. Um, I really, the way that I view it is kind of, you know, one of my teachers, he... he he used to give these like 45 minute introductions to meditation in public. And I've listened to a lot of the tapes of them. I've also been present. I was also there for several. And there used to be 15 minutes of question and answers at the end of the 45 minute discussion. And it was pretty common for someone to submit a question, something along the lines of like, are you enlightened? And his answer uh, has stuck with me to this day. I think it's quite powerful. He always answered the same way when that question came up. He would say, uh, he would answer twofold which basically covers both of the reasons why a human being would ask that question. And the first, the first answer was, the state, the state of my mind has no bearing on the state of your mind. That's the first answer. The second answer is, he would say, I'm certainly qualified to teach you meditation. So if you're asking that question because of some kind of like thing you want me to do for you, it's irrelevant. It's not going to happen. The state of my mind has no bearing on the state of yours. And, or if you're asking because you want to see my credentials, right? I'm qualified to do what I do. So focusing too much on the teacher means you're not focusing on the teaching, which is where it is, really. All of that, all, all underlined, highlighted, starred, in your notebooks, all that is good about Buddha is a result of my long-term association with Zen and tea. So together, if we're going to pay homage to anything, together let us turn and say Zen and tea are great. Together let us bow to Zen and tea. 
and, and these practices. These are what's important. And if you're worried about the karmas of, or the story or the drama or the positive or negative spin on this person you call teacher, that narrative is just wasted energy that could be spent on the practice, the teachings, right, the, the, that, are, that are there. So that's, th th that's not really, that whole conversation isn't really an answer to your question. I already answered that when I said there's two things, which is all things, is, all, te all that is not me is my master, and that there's some kind of like karmic bond an analogous to romance. Um, but this is important to talk about because, you know, we're sitting here and we're reflecting on my path and my lineage and my role as a teacher. And certainly my role as a teacher is, is not, I'm nobody's Roshi. I'm not grand master. People say, I studied with Master Wuda. You didn't, no, you didn't because you wouldn't be using that word if you did. I'm, the, my teacher always used to say that the only masters in Zen are those who have died. The rest of us are students. And I'm a very much a student. And I don't believe the quality, the qualities, the credentials that I'm looking for in a teacher are not about some kind of cosmic ability, some kind of uh, transcendent state, some kind of otherness. These aren't the qualities that I'm looking for. I would say, for me, the th qualifications that make someone qualified to teach something are pretty universal, right? A, an, a long-term association with those practices, right? That has resulted in some degree of both, uh, of both in intellectual and experiential understanding of those practices. And three, an ability to articulate those practices to me in a way that I can understand so that I can begin to do them and then to offer me guidance as I uh, practice those practices. And number four is, is the one nobody is talking about, which I just mentioned. Actually, for me, I think it's important that teachers discuss openly their own faults and be transparent about their character defects and that they... And, and now this is the other side that I can share with you now that I am a teacher and have gone through my transmission. I think that one of the main skills that you have to learn to become a teacher, which is a big part of why, for me, I would suggest that my students not start teaching because they maybe haven't yet developed a certain skill. And that skill is the ability to not get involved in all those dramas or of higher or lower. The ability to, even when somebody's giving you respect, instead of the egoic clinging to it or wanting it or needing it, becoming needy to respect or needy to praise or needy to money or needy to anything that is, is giving because the role of a teacher is really a servant. It's about giving. It's not about taking. So the way to deal with that is you have to develop a skill to do what I just spoke about, which is that when somebody comes up and says, oh, Wuda, you're so great, right? Instead of my ego going, yeah, and like basking in that, you know, which is very easy, I have to develop a skill to be able to say, yeah, Zen and T are great. Because I know what that person is seeing, whatever they're seeing, whatever positive thing they're seeing in me, it's they're, they're really looking at my practice, not at me. So I, I have to do, and I don't mean physically step out of the way or even physically say those things. I'm talking about an internal skill. So that stuff doesn't cling to me. And then you have to deal with the opposite too. You have to not get down when all the, like, you know, in the popular culture now, the haters. There's a bunch of haters, right? Because just as people like to put people on pedestals, even that person's like, no, nah, I don't want to be on a pedestal. Then you're like, yep, nope, you're on a pedestal. And then a bunch of other people are like, dude on a pedestal, hey. And they want to feel good by knocking people down. I, I'm not worth it. I'm not worth, I'm certainly not worth it being on a pedestal. I'm, not, I'm certainly also not worth the wasted energy of knocking down. I knock myself down on a daily basis. You don't got to do that for me. I fall down all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty constantly tripping. So uh, 
you know, that game also is, is a, you know, my teacher's teacher was quite well known. And something my teacher told me is that when, you know, when he was young and studying with his teacher, that the, that the uh, people would come to learn about him instead of coming to learn about tea. And I face this all the time. People want to do podcasts or interviews with me. And like, it's just like, oh, like, it, 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 boom, here we go again. So where, who are you? Tell us your story. Where do you come? It's like they, they've come and it's not, it's well intentioned. It's not a, it's not like there, there's anything negative in it. I, I understand, right? That that's the approach. But for me, it's like, so not what I want to talk about. And I'm not interested, especially again, another interview. Come on, my story. It's not that interesting. It's certainly not interesting to me. <laughs> I've, you know, I, so it's, it's certainly not, not a, a valuable a, a story. It, to me, it's, it's, it's in the way. It's a narrative that I can get attached to and create a false sense of separation. Um, so I want to talk about Zen and tea. And so that's really what's important. So, you know, just like if you're looking for, if you're looking for, constantly looking for signs, you'll miss all the signs that are right in front of you in, in your life because you're looking for, you know, if you're looking out for only for big experiences, you're going to miss the path of life, which is a bunch of little experiences like our slogan this week also teaches. If you're looking for the, the, holy, the holy teacher who can see your mind before you, you, you know, you don't even have to speak because they read your mind and have powers and they, they meet this criteria of, of what, you know, it is. You might find that if you find such a person that's super red. I, you know, I, I'd like to go see him too. I need some of that also. I need mentors as well. So, you know, but I'm certainly not that. that my lineage is not that. Uh, I'm, yeah, and so I've, you know, my, the qualifications I am looking for in a teacher is just a, a, a person who has a, a long-term association with a practice and has both a theoretical understanding of that practice and a deep immersion in it. So I don't want just a photography teacher that knows the theory of photography, right? I want a photography teacher that also has a lot of experience with cameras and taking photographs. So a theoretical and practical understanding that comes from long-term association. And then that person should be articulate and they have the, uh, the ability to um, share those things with me, you know? And then not have any like ego dramas or trips or, you know, I'm not interested in that. Um, so that's just my take on that. And that wasn't really, that's not really the answer to your question. The answer to your question really isn't an answer. It's that first of all, all things are my master. And second of all, there's just some kind of bond and it's just the uh, cosmic and you can't really get away from it. It's like, like romance. So you got more than you bit off more than you could chew. That question is a powerful one. But I like when any question like that comes up to include all that stuff so that I can at least, from my end, play my part in, in saying, like, I am not going to participate in any of that drama with you. Right? My teacher used to say, literally, he used to use like legal language. I don't remember the exact phrase. Sometimes it pops in my head, but right now it's not there. But he used to say often that like he would t he basically I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you I'll tell you the role of a teacher and I'll tell you the role of a student and now the contract's signed if you don't like it get a lawyer it's basically like I'm saying like if you go start writing stories about the holy buddha or you want to knock me down off of some pedestal I was never on it, it, you know I've stated where I'm coming from so now that's all on you and so that's why I like any opportunity that I can to take advantage of that opportunity to state that fact. I'm not interested in playing uh, any kind of guru trip or game like that of authority over someone or, um, you know, higher or lower, any of those, those kinds of dramas. I'm not interested in those dramas. And... Um, So I'm, I won't participate in that exchange. 
what, that's not what I have to offer. I'm not a Roshi. I'm not anybody's master. I'm not anybody's, um, you know, I'll put it to you really simply, I guess, to end up, wrap this com conversation up. My teacher always said, if, if no matter what your intentions are, no matter what your intentions are, if a student, if a teacher stands between a student and the light, they cast a shadow. No matter how good the intentions are, if a teacher stands between the light and a student, they cast a shadow. I'm not a middleman. I have tools, a bag of tools, and you can go build your house. And I have experience building. So to some extent, I can help you blueprint your house. And if you have some problems along the way, I can maybe, maybe I'll have passed through a similar experience or my teacher will have passed through a similar experience or his teacher or so on. And I have the, maybe the answer to what to do when you meet that obstacle to building your house. That's it. Hopefully that helps. Matt is asking, for someone getting into tea, where would the priority be of these three? Identifying the various levels of boiling water, trying new teas, or acquiring the proper teaware? Hmm. For someone first getting into tea, what is the first thing you learn? How to boil water? Was that the first one? Yep. What was the second one? Trying new teas. Trying new teas. And getting the right teaware. I, I would say all of the above. These are all wonderful. Uh, tea is, is water. If you don't understand water, you don't understand tea. One of my favorite authors on tea from the Ming Dynasty, he called his treatise like, um, how would you translate? Like uh, experiments from, from the water tasting studio. Right, something like that uh, would be a translation of it. And it, it's a uh, uh, Li Ruhua is his name, and uh, he, it's, it's like a. It, it's saying like you know, anybody can taste tea, but to taste water is to really taste tea. So, water is tea. And um, you know, teaware before tea, teaware will last your whole lifetime. Tea will come and go, right? And low quality tea in a great teapot will uplift that tea, whereas high quality tea and a low quality teapot will drag it down below the teapot even. So teaware, in terms of purchasing, always teaware before tea. And of course, you can't learn about tea without tasting lots of tea. You've got to taste lots of tea as much as you can. All right, we're out of time. Thank you so much. I hope you have a really beautiful week. You can think about how the world could change if you smile and, it, and if that's possible for you. And uh, we'll meet again next week and have continue this conversation. In the meantime, stay safe and happy and peaceful.